All right, let me start out by saying to you that, that as I've been mentioning to you lately, it seems to me that it is unequivocally clear that we are living in the most critical period in the history of the world. I don't doubt that for one nanosecond. Not in the whole history of the world have we seen what we're seeing now. The summation of all things is coming into play. There's a great falling away, as you know, in our country. We've been leading the way. We've been, we've been amazing. Did you know, for instance, we, we made this because we were in the streets and we forced people to accept it. Same-sex marriage, as if, you know, homosexuals predominate our population. They're about 3% of 320 billion people. 320 million people in the United States of America. Very small people, but a very vocal group. Do you know this? And I think I mentioned to you, I didn't realize this. This just came to my attention. That there is a law now, it's a law from the Supreme Court that demands the right of a man, two men marry, and two women marry. Did you know there's no such law on the books for a normal marriage? We didn't need a law because we've been doing this for all the time, all the years until now, and suddenly we've had to change the Constitution to make room for same-sex marriage. But it just goes to show you we're falling away. Now, here's the thing. It's happened in a sly, slow way. It's developed. One person said, I've evolved to accept this. The most preposterous statement I've ever heard in my life. But we've, we've heard it so much that we become desensitized. It don't mean anything to us anymore. We think, oh, well, you know, different strokes for different folks, as we used to say in the old days. And uh, so we have a falling away. We have people are falling away. Thank God for a whole large group of people who on the 22nd, I believe it was on Friday, were marching in Washington, D.C., as they do every year, for pro-life people who were marching. And even though there was threatened to be one of the worst storms and turned out to be one of the worst storms in history in Washington, D.C., nonetheless, there were thousands of people marching because there's still people that believe in life rather than premature death for sure. So we're no, we're in the last day. Let's just kind of prove this. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day the day, known as capital, that means the day of the Lord when he comes. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. We know that hasn't happened, but the prelude to that is that there will be a great falling away. Then there's another scripture that talks about the fact that we will live in the last days in perilous times. They exist. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.1. But know this. That in the last read this with me, that in the last days perilous times will come. I don't think I have to convince you that we're living in those perilous and distressing times, as you know. But on the positive end of the spectrum, as I've also been reminding you, there's a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's been promised by the Lord. Let's look at Joel chapter two, verses twenty eight and twenty nine. Would you read with me? Because this is where we're at. We're in the midst of this revival. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And go on. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Don't be surprised that young people are beginning to get in interested. Starting with just children, you'd be surprised how they're getting interested in teenagers, getting interested in the Lord. Brother Anthony mentioned earlier in our gym just this week, 10 young men receiving Christ as Savior. On your men service, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And it talks about the maid servants as well. So let's give the Lord a hand for that promise that he has given to us. And this will begin to materialize. Now, we're in the, in the first parts of it. We're kind of like the, the cursor had just moved in that direction. And now there, it has to develop. So the clarion call to us today is for us to employ. Now, watch. We're going to get into deep water today. And that's why you come, because you want to grow and you want to go another step in the Lord. 
And uh, I want you to know that there's a clarion call today for us to employ our authority and power as a Christian to influence the outcome. I'm going to go into deep water here. The war over reality. I hope you have your notes and hang on to them. God has given to man, now listen, the limited yet distinct inherent power to imagine. We have an amazing ability to imagine things, and sometimes inventors have this, and architectural people, and all kinds of people, designers, and people that have that kind of a, they use their mind in that direction. We have an amazing ability to imagine and to define and then establish reality. Follow me very closely, and you'll understand a little bit more why there are such, even though widely diverse, many groups that are absolutely stayed in the wool with where they're at and what they believe. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we know that we, we, if we line up with the Word of God and we begin to practice what we say that we believe, and discern the spiritual warfare is around us, and align, align ourselves with God's side, something very great is going to happen. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We do not wrestle, this is the battle now, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, now watch, prince of, not only evil spirits, but principalities. What do you think? Canton is a principality. I mean, you're talking about a place where people reside. Principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Keep a note on that. In heavenly places. We'll deal with that. Notice that Matthew gives us in Matthew 18 and 19 and through 20, 18, 19, now, watch very closely how this reads. Again, I say to you, it's talking to you, if any two agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now, go back to the verse 19. If you can just slip back to that verse. Now, I want to watch this. Now, notice. When two people agree on this basis, it changes the atmosphere. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Well, in order for two people to agree on something, whatever it may be for healing or deliverance of some sort, and for him to say what he did, it will be done, that has to change the circumstances and the atmosphere that surround us. Now, I'm going to take you into deep water, so watch this. Let's go into Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. This is the book of Genesis. Now, notice, God was so upset at what had happened with the people that he created. Remember, this is the story about the Tower of Babel. There were people who were all of one language, and there weren't anything that separated people, and they were all of one, one language. Now, watch. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. And they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Are you getting that? Just, just think about that for a moment. The Amplified puts it this way. And now nothing they imagine that they can do will be impossible to them. Here's, uh, here's what I believe. I believe just like communism, socialism, um, you know, all of the different isms that there are, capitalism, for instance, which we practice here in our own country, come as a result of people coming with one mind and beginning to establish a direction. Remember I said that we could establish reality? So what becomes reality, to, for instance, to communism, to the communists early on when, uh, whether it was Lenin or sometime before that, when it became a part of what Russia was told and what they were taught because of their atheistic position, 
Little by little, people have to come in step with the government. So little by little, communism became reality. In other words, it became a reality because people who have the distinct ability to imagine or to think, to, uh, to be able to, to conceive, were able to, to accept it. Same thing with capitalism. When, when the United States was uh, uh, discovered and, and then later on the, the, the Constitution was written and the Bill of Rights and all of that, it was a group of people that came together willing to sacrifice their life. Many of them did sacrifice their life. And they weren't just people. There was Many of them were attorneys. They were doctors. They were wealthy people. Some of them, others who were not. But they came together. They didn't care what they lost. And many of them lost a lot of their fortune. But nonetheless, they came together. And they established certain principles. And people who began to accept the principles as it began to develop, People began to hear about it in other parts of the world. And so this great experiment that was going on in the United States began to draw people from all over the world. And in those days, generally speaking, like my own parents, who came over from Italy, so I'm a first-generation American, and when they came over, they came over because they wanted to be a part of the United States of America. And it wasn't very long before they became assimilated into the American, they, they bought the American system. And, and that was with 40 million people that came through Ellis Island from all Europe and all over, they came and they came through there. And later on, some came through Canada and other ways. And they came, but they came because they heard about what was going on here. It was a reality that had been established by a group of people who bought into democracy, who believed that it should be of the people, for the people, and by the people. And they wanted to come so they could have freedom of religion, for instance, freedom to, to live in a country that was free. Unfortunately, what has happened in these most recent days is there is also a religion of Mohammedism, or they don't like to be called that, but Islam, which was founded by Mohammed. And I've got some quotations here so you understand what the Muslim faith is about. I don't think they, they don't like you to just say it out. Let me quote you some things, and then you'll know that I'm telling you what I read. <clears throat> In March of 632, the prophet Mohammed said this, and these are his direct words. He said, I was ordered to fight all men until they say there is no God but Allah. Saladin, in the year 1189, said, I shall cross the sea to their islands to pursue them until there remains no one on the face of the earth who does not acknowledge Allah. The Ayatollah Khomeini, I mean, he has more recent days. He said, we will export our revolution throughout the world until the, the calls come out, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And on and on it goes, and you could go through it. I have all the materials, so it's nothing I make up. Now, here's the difference. What I'm teaching is about you can form reality. Now, we did this in America, and people came from every religion and all over, fit in together, even though they might have had a different religion. They certainly obliged the Constitution and obliged the laws of the land. The difference between the Muslims, when they come to America, they cannot assimilate. If there's just one or two in a place, they have to by force. But any place in our country, whether it's in Michigan, whether it's in Minnesota, where you have large amounts of people. And this is also happening in France and in England, where they have a great percentage of people that have come over and they are of a Muslim faith. The problem with this is they cannot accept the reality that we have built here in America. They have to come in and when they have a group then they insist on living under Sharia law. They're not willing to live under democracy on the American way. And so little by little, especially now in these areas I mentioned in Dearborn, Michigan, and Minnesota, where they have largest, then they live under Sharia law. And when they work on a job, if a company does not allow them to do their prayer times, and don't matter if it's in the middle of the day, in the middle of production, they want to do it. And if not, then... They will strike or whatever. In one place in Minnesota, 
200 people did that, 200 Muslims, and they were fired. They would not assimilate to the American way. And this has happened in England and France, as I mentioned. In the areas where they live, they have what we co used to call ghettos here in our country, ghettos in different parts of the big cities. But like ghettos, they have large constituents, maybe, maybe of several hundred thousand people, may live in one area, and they live under Sharia law. Sharia law, folks, is not the American way. And we'll never be able to accept that. And so to think that we can befriend people like that and live side by side with them is really a stretch because they don't want to live your way. It'd be fine if we could live side by side. I don't care what nationality, what religion is that, as long as we could live and I could still be who I am, but they, they just can't, cannot handle that. So we're having problems all over the world. Uh, but, but this goes back to what I'm, I'm teaching here, that when you have any kind of ism, no, nor, normally speaking, people, that becomes, see, whatever Muhammad taught, and then he got into the Quran, got written, and of course, through the years, it goes down, and so as people have bought into it, so they walk in lockstep with that. And so as a result, you have that kind of reality. But what I'm trying to teach you today is it's true. Anybody can do it because we read it in, 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 in uh, Genesis 11, 6. We read that they, could, uh, they can do anything now that they imagine to do. Anytime people really dis determine to do that as a group, generally speaking, unless they're violating the law in the country they live in or whatever, I mean, that becomes reality to them. And so that leaves the possibility for us to begin to establish a different kind of atmosphere. That's why I've been telling you, you're not mere men. I refuse to give you gospel light. I just can't. God has given me revelations and insight, and I'm going to give it to you the best I can. It may seem far out to some, but I know the truth, and the Bible is very clear. So ultimately, then, that defines the reality around the people who believe that because they become lockstep with it, I said. Now, the devil wants the world to believe and to accept that Christianity is divisive, hypocritical, and spiritually impotent. By believing this, we would reinforce the deceptive view of the church. I've never seen a time when I've seen the church so demeaned and so looked down on the Christian church today, that, that, that in, in my whole lifetime, I've never known it like that. Where even in our United States military, you say, why do you mention it again? Because it's too big. It's too big for me not to mention. In our own military, our chaplains have been told, do not mention the name of Jesus in your counseling with the soldiers. And what do they need when they're traumatized? What do they need? They need Jesus because he is the peace. He is the shalom. Come on, give him a praise. So we have the power. That's what I'm trying to drive at. We have the opportunity as Christians to establish the atmosphere. We can establish it. I'm going to prove it to you by the Scriptures. Our agreement must coincide with God's plan for a holy, undivided, powerful church that he is calling us to establish his kingdom on earth. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, 27. That he might present her, he speaks to the church here, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That is God's purpose. Now, there are, there's a role. Remember, I said we could make a difference and change the atmosphere. There's a role that angels and demons play on all this. Of course, we've become so spiritual and so modernized and so worldly now, we don't even remember that there are angels that bigger than you just pin on your collar and, and demons that are big enough to cause big disruption in your life. But let's look at Revelation 12, 7, and 8. Now, notice this tells about this spiritual battle. and We're in that kind of a battle. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But they did not prevail. Now watch this part. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Do you understand what this implies? This implies that in a given city where you live, where we live, where all hell is breaking loose, our city drive-by shootings almost every week 
and nearby Cleveland the same. And I don't have to tell you in Chicago and Baltimore and New York and L.A. and wherever else you're at how this is happening. There's an atmosphere of death, a lack of appreciation of death, a lack of pre appreciation of life. And so we have all this. So there's an atmosphere. There's a demonic control. People don't do these things in the natural. That's not reasonable and rational thinking to take somebody's life. Half the time, and especially with terrorists, you don't, doesn't matter to them that you're innocent. Doesn't matter your children, your grandmothers. Don't make any difference to them. They're indiscriminate with us. They'll wrap themselves with with explosives and set themselves off in the midst. They've just done it. They've just done it in North Africa. They've just done it uh, again in Afghanistan. Every place you look, they're doing it. They do it always in Israel, has to face it almost every day. If they're not, they don't have something strapped around them, they have a knife trying to knife an Israeli. And so it's perilous times, there's no doubt about it. So there's an atmosphere. Now, if my idea here holds true, and if any two on earth agree, as touching anything shall ask, it shall be done of my Father which is in heaven. Coinciding with Genesis 11, 6, we can do anything that we imagine to do. And that's why the Lord had to, just, had to stir them up and change the languages so they couldn't, they couldn't co cohort together. They couldn't understand each other because they were able. And so we still are able, but we can do this from a Christian atmosphere. And you and I can believe God for a miracle. Look at Ephesians 6, 12. And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I believe we read this before, but I want you to think, I think we read it at the start of the sermon. But against, now notice, principalities. That means the city, the county, the state, the village where you live, whether wherever it is. A principality. We, we're fighting against the principality. Powers against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. It talks about them. We know they hover about us. Now you say, Brother Dave, you just become, you know, you just become a little bit sensitive. No, it's just the truth from the Word of God. What I'm excited about is we can do something about it. Do you know that if these truths that I'm giving you today hold true, we can stand together, united in faith, like we're doing more and more about, about pro-life in our city. But we can do this more and more, and we can begin to bind the evil spirits that are hovering about this city, city you live in, about this city, about that, that causes and brings influence and brings hopelessness in people's eyes where they have to do things that are strange and, and extreme in order to survive. And we can break the bonds of those evil ones, those evil imps that are, that are trained. They've been trained. They've been sent here by the, the evil one. And they've been sent here to destroy this city, to destroy this state. Did you know in the state of Ohio right now, there were, I think last year, 3,800 deaths from heroin overdose. The devil's doing everything possible. People are listening to him, giving in to the temptations and the wiles of the enemy. And as a result, the state is slowly, the young people of the state in some quarters, of course, not all, but there's being destruction and people are dying and they're overdosing on something that the devil has led them into. Principalities and power occupy heavenly places. And it's the Father's purpose as he sums all things up in Christ, things in heaven and earth and upon the earth. Look at Ephesians 1.10. I'll just keep supporting this. But in the dispensation of the fullness of time, anyone that has any spiritual sense or any biblical knowledge knows we're living in the last days. I mean, he says, when these things, the things we're seeing, begin to come to pass, lift up your head for your redemption Draw thigh. So he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, which we are living in, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. We have more power than you possibly can imagine. Ephesians 3.10. To the intent that now, 
didn't say yesterday or next week. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God, that's what's beginning to happen. That's why you have such a hunger. You're not willing to just set business as usual, same old, same old. You want to you want, you hear truth. You want to hear truth that, that begins to stir your heart. You want to hear something that, that will change things, not just something that keeps us the same. Manifold wisdom might be made known by the church. God is raising up the church. There, it's coming, you know, it's happening more overseas than here in America. If you went to Argentina, you went, especially South America, if you went to Brazil, you would be surprised the magnitude of the size of the churches. One church I know of in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, 25,000, larger than Joel Osteen Church. And all over, people are beginning to believe, and they're, they're forceful with their belief. They're believing, and the Spirit of the Lord is being poured out all over the world. America's a little bit behind time, but America's going to get its dose of the Holy Spirit as well. To the intent that now, why not us? And why not not now? If God says the intent is that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers, heavenly places, why not now and why not us? Can I hear a little shout or something? Just a little encouragement up here. This scripture reveals God's glorious plan, and the plan is through the church. I say it's through the church. He's going to make known his manifold wisdom to the principalities and powers, not only here on earth, but in the heavenly places, which means that we can affect the evacuation of some jerks that are living above us. Not humans, but they're jerks. <laughs> Imps. And we can have power to say, you've been here long enough. As we stand together as a body of Christ, we come against you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God whom you fear. We bind your evil powers and we command you to leave our city. Leave our neighborhoods, you foul devil, you intruder. Church has to become a little bit aroused. It's going to make known his, 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 his authority. And when we, the body of Christ, agree with our head, that is Christ in heaven, the Spirit of Christ himself displaces, remember what we read earlier in Revelation? After there was war in heaven, it broke out, and then it says they were there no more. In other words, they got displaced. They got kicked out. They got their eviction notice. Isn't it amazing that you and I as landlords of the kingdom of God <laughs> have the power to evict those foul, evil spirits in the name of... And you don't have to give them 45 days or whatever the law says about the other kind of eviction. We can say, devil, when I say move, I mean now. When I say get out, I'm not talking about next week. I'm not talking about in some other place. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about right here. Get out in the name of Jesus. Come on, give him a shout. My Lord. When the church becomes aggressive in its agreement and in our will, in the Word of God, then the presence of God increases in spiritual places all over in the heavens. It begins to set an atmosphere. We want signs, wonders, miracles. That's the way they happen. God can't operate. You remember, when Jesus went into his own hometown, if you notice, it says he healed just a few folks because of their unbelief. He, just a few that he happened to get to in proximity. But as a rule, he was not accepted. And that's what has happened. But we have to agree together in Jesus' name that God's with us and we're not going to say no any longer. We're going to, when the Lord says go, we're going to say, Lord, send me. I hope we don't have to say I'm a man of unclean lips. But we just need to say we have to go. Hallelujah. God calls us. But we need to be aggressive. And so they are displaced. They have to move now. They may go somewhere else. Uh, that's, up to, uh, that's up to the next city to pray about. Praise God. We're, we're responsible for our own cities, communities, and uh, wherever, wherever, wherever we live. So when the church is passive, and this is what has happened to the church, it's pathetic. The church has become so passive it's almost irrelevant. It doesn't have any relevancy by far and large. I mean, much of the church, it's not that people aren't attending church. 
But if you only get gospel light and you never find out who you really are in Christ and you don't know anything about the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to miss out on a lot that God has made available in the Word of God. Now, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings or anything. So when the church is passive and indifferent or carnal, the powers of hell rule over the affairs of men. Marriages break up, crime increases, sin becomes rampant, and that's what we're seeing in the good old USA. Not only in the good old USA, Canada the same. Some of the other Western world is buying into it as well. I believe I, I have this right in Canada. You cannot be bold and preach like I do. If I mention anything about same-sex marriage and I said anything that homosexuality is a sin, if I said that, it would be put off the air. Could be arrested. And that could happen in America. You see, because reality, remember, here's what I established early on. A reality is established by people who become one in accord and they begin to accept a philosophy or an ideology or whatever it is, and they go in lockstep together, and that becomes reality, and it grows, and it can become a whole nation, as we've seen in some nations of the world that have given in to this kind of a foul intrusion. Now, the secret weapon against the enemy is for us to believe the Word of God. Is it? Is it, is it asking too much of you, if you're a Christian, to believe the Word of God? Am I asking too much of you when I say that to have biblical faith, you have to learn not to doubt any at all? So, oh, I thought you could kind of, you know, live loose. If you want things to happen, you can't live loose. It's all or nothing. God wants all of you. His name's not Adonai for nothing. Adonai means master. And what he wants for you to do is become obedient to him. And the only way you become obedient to him, you've got to become obedient to the Word of God. Are you listening? The weapon that God has given to us to combat the enemy is the Word of God. It is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Man, you get that sword, that's the Word of God. It'll slash, it'll cut. It'll, imp it'll, go, it'll impale. <laughs> it'll do things you can't do on your own. Praise God. But you can believe that. You can trust him. In fact, I told you, I think it was last week, that I heard a message a few years ago preached by Kenneth Copeland, and he told about how we have that helmet of salvation, we have the, you know, the shield of faith, that tells about all the armor we have. And he said, if we're all Christians and we all have that, then when the devil looks down and tries to get us or zap us, he don't know which one is you, because we all look the same. We all have the helmet on. We have the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit. He said, where's that Dave? Let me get that Dave Lombard. I don't know what happened. I must have had my helmet off or something. He got me the other day, but, <laughs> but he didn't win. He didn't win. He didn't hurt me in the sense of any permanent damage. Didn't hurt me with you. You put up with my sunglasses. Uh, and. You'll probably ask me, I think I have an idea. If, that was cute how the choir did. I didn't, I didn't know they was going to do that. But anyhow, wouldn't it be something if next week I take my sunglasses off and you look at me and you say, Brother Dave, put your glasses on. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'll leave them on just in case because I don't want I don't to hurt, see myself get hurt here. So I'm going to be careful. Satan is is unmasked, the Bible unmasked. Let's look at uh, John 8, 44. You are of your father. Jesus isn't afraid to call a spade a spade. Right. He's not afraid to call it like it is. And most people that are following Brother Dave's ministry commend me because I will call it like it is. And they like what the guy said that hadn't seen me for a long time, a minister that served with us in our community, and he left for about 10 years, and he came back, and I happened to meet him, and he was with another friend. He said, you know, Brother Dave, he's the one that's in your face with the gospel. <laughs> and I said, thank you very much, shook his hand, went and walked away. You are, the, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. That's why he, 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 you know, he majors in lying. He's a, he's, a, he's a prevaricator. He's just natural at it. He just does it. That's what he is. He's a liar. 
because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Well, I refuse to continue to believe his lies. I refuse to be, I'm just a mere person, I just got to take it. If I get slapped down, I just got to say, well, I guess I deserve that. No, if I get slapped down, I jump up. I tell, I tell you, I wish you could talk to Brother Brian, our director up there, and Brother Anthony can try this too. He was three offices down from me here in the church when, when this happened to me a couple of weeks ago when I fell. I went to go and my feet I had my shoes on with the treads because it was winter time and all that. So when, when I, they stuck, so I was already moving. <laughs> I said, Brother Dave, don't do that too far. We don't want to see you do it here. But anyhow, they stuck, and I, and I fell full. And I hit, the, I hit the floor so hard that Brian from three offices heard it and ran down there. And by the time he got there, it was not as big as a golf ball. He ran and got some ice, and we put some ice on there. Now, the devil meant that for harm. But he just slowed me down. He didn't stop me, folks. Yeah, I rested a little bit more. But praise God, I'm telling you, I've got my hand in the hand of the man who has a plan. When I, the first week that this happened, and I felt like, well, maybe I shouldn't go. I looked so bad, I felt like, you know, I didn't think of sunglasses at first. And I already called Brother Anthony and I said, you get ready. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. I look terrible, and I just don't know. I, I can't see very well. I don't know. You know, and it was, it was, I told him that on Friday. On Saturday, I called him up. I said, Brother Anthony, I'm going to preach. I said, I, I was wrestling with this thing, and God dealt with me. And he said, what are you asking your people to do? I said, walk by faith. Get up and walk by faith and get in that pulpit on Sunday. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'm glad I did. Look at John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life and the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. If God tells us that if any two on earth, well, there's a lot of twos here today. <clears throat> If any two on earth agree upon touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done. What do you want to see? Do you want to see revival? Do you want to see raising the dead? Let me go over here, Matthew chapter 10. You can get it for me on the, on the screen if you would. Maybe I can get it. Chapter 10, I'm going to show you what Jesus said when he sent some out. And this is what I'm asking him to do for you. So if you're not ready for that, well, maybe you better go into basic training. It's saying, when he had called his 12 disciples together, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And he goes on to name them. And they go out and they do the work of God and they heal the sick. Raise the dead. Well, for your information, a few years ago when I was as serving as a missionary, at least for a short term, and was, had been to Chile and South America and then went to, to Mexico, I caught a disease, uh, some sort of a encephalitis and meningitis together came in. And I got it in Chile. I didn't know what I did, but... Somehow in Chile, the, the refuge, what shall I say, the sewer lines and the freshwater lines, somehow because of age, whatever, they got intermingled. I didn't know that. And the, the grapes were sprayed by this water that was unclean. I didn't know it. So I grabbed a big, beautiful grapes, and I grabbed a whole mouthful, and I, a handful, and I began to eat them real good. And the missionary, you know, people can get, become immune if you live in that kind of circumstance. He must have been immune. He didn't get sick. My Lord, we went and left, left there and flew into Mexico intending to do a ministry there, and encephalitis hit me like a ton of bricks, and I mean a fever that went to 110 and would not go down. And I had to finally go to my hotel room. Sister Marlene called. The, the, we was in right in downtown Mexico City. And uh, right, there was one of their big hotels. I forget the name of it now. But the, they, they were so big that they had a lady doctor in the hotel on, on call. And she came and she looked at me. And I, I was delirious at the time Marlene tells me the story. 
And she said, I cannot help him. I have to call somebody. And so she left and called. And, and a man came in, uh, supposed, supposed to be a specialist and a surgeon, whatever, came in with his satchel and everything. And he came in. I was on the bed. And I was laying up where the pillow was up. And I was laying there. And so he came. And while he came to begin to examine me, suddenly my head flipped back. And that's very characteristic of meningitis. And also life left my body. And so he pulled me down, this is the story Merlene tells me, pulled me down in the bed along with her right beside him, and he began to check me again with his stethoscope and so on, and he checked me all over, listened for my breath, listened to my heart, and so on, packed up his bag and began to walk out the door. And Sister Merlene screaming at the top of her voice, help him, doctor. She said, help him. He's very muy enfermo. He's very, very sick. And the doctor says, nada, there's no vitals I can do. I'm going to send the coroner. And he left the room. And there I lay. And Sister Merlene got on top. Said, God, you're not going to leave me here by myself. You foul death, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. What the doctor could not do, life poured back into my body. And I snapped up. And I said, what happened, honey? Her face, she was right over me. I knew something had happened. Oh, nothing, honey, nothing, nothing. <laughs> How well did God heal you? Well, we were going to leave that Monday. Everybody in the hotel, but if you're in Mexico, this is interesting. Everybody, the bellboys, everybody, what you need? The, I get you, what? Penicillin, me get you, we get you. Sulfur drug, no, no problem, we get it. No, no, no. Yeah, we inject. <laughs> it came with an injection. No, 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 we don't need you. Thank you. It got in the hotel where this is heaven. Come Monday morning, folks. Came time to leave. We had been traveling for three and a half weeks. We had a lot of luggage. And so when it came time to go, the taxi came. We called the taxi. I went out and all of our luggage. They said, oh, me, we'll help you, the bell button. No, never mind. I carried every bit of that luggage myself. Got it there. Had one under my arm, one under this arm, two then gone off. <laughs> Stuck those things in a, in a taxi cab, got to that plane, got home from into Canton, Ohio, and guess what? One of the Timken sons, I think it was... One of the sons was uh, Tim, I think. Tim Timken was getting off the plane at the same time. There was nobody meeting him. All the people from the church were meeting me out there in the airport. And when I got out, I unashamedly stepped down off, and I got off the plane, and I kissed the ground. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Following week, went to our doctor, did a total test on me, confirmed that I had had meningitis and, and had encephalitis, and he said, something happened. Dave, I don't know what it was. He said, looks like it hit the brain and aborted. I said, well, thank you, Jesus. Now, if you think I look a little Looney Tunes or whatever, you have to understand I've been through a lot. But, <laughs> but I thank Jesus that he's a miracle worker, and I never had any any from that ever again because he is a healer and I trust him as my healer and I trust him if he unveils to us that we can do things we didn't think we could do that we could agree together and band together and get against the devil and pray the prayer of faith and believe that the atmosphere can be changed then I'm going to believe it it may seem far out yeah the old hippies used to say far out brother Dave you think that was far out you ought to see where we're going now we're going to a, to a tier higher than we've ever been before hallelujah God is bigger than we ever thought he was he has more power than we ever thought he had he loves us more than we ever thought he did and he's able to take us by our hands and lift us up and say there's no problem there's no test there's no trial that's too big I'll take you through I'll make you so successful as you walk through the valley I'll be through with you as you walk over the mountaintop I'll be with you you'll never have to doubt again because I'll never leave you and never forsake you hallelujah and I feel like saying greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world glory and honor honor and praise. Come on, shout unto the Lord. <laughs>